All right, we're going to recap the beginning of this lecture since it's been a while, and then we will complete chapter 10 and move on to chapter 11, the first part. So today is all sensory. Um, recall that um, your stimuli or um, your sensory stimuli will be detected, right? And each uh, type of stimulus has to have a specific receptor. So we have specific receptors to detect the different types of stimuli. And different types of stimuli can be light, touch, temperature, odor, etc. Um, these stimuli are converted into electrical signals and that process of taking the stimulus and converting it into an electrical signal is called transduction and then that goes to the central nervous system to be integrated so it goes the input um, stimulus converted to electrical signal goes to the brain to be integrated you've already learned about a lot of types of receptors both from anatomy and then in the lab that we had um, so you know photoreceptors detect light chemoreceptors detect different chemicals, nociceptors detect pain, thermal receptors, temperature, mechanoreceptors um, have a whole lot of uh, variation, um, but things like pressure and then osmoreceptors um, detect um, the, they're primarily in a region of the brain to um, detect osmotic pressure, make sure fluid balance is correct. Um, Proporeceptors are the new receptor we introduced to you last um, week, and these are throughout your muscles. They allow you to have fine motor control, and they also help you to know your body position. Where is your arm? What position is your leg in? Where is your foot right now? Right, um, Coordinating all the parts of your body together so that you have control over it and you know where it is at. Okay, we also talked about generator potentials. Generator potentials are the specific term used for receptor potentials of the sensory systems. Okay, so locally, wherever your stimulus is being applied, you have your graded potential, meaning a small stimulus will cause a small depolarization and the larger your stimulus, the larger that depolarization is. Um, but you do not get an action potential until you reach the threshold. So here in number four, you finally received a stimulus large enough to reach that threshold and then the action potential happens. So action potentials are still all or none. Okay. And we also see the, the same relationship we saw before with the frequency of action potentials will increase as the um, stimulus increases. So here we have our generator potentials. So you know we're talking about sensory, right? So stimulus such as light, not enough to reach threshold, so no action potential. Now you have a larger stimulus, so more light, and you start to see action potentials occur because you've sustained that stimulus and you've sustained it um, at or above the threshold. Then here we have an even larger stimulus, so bright light, you get lots of action potentials, um, one after another, so more frequent. And last time we introduced the idea of tonic versus phasic receptors and so remember that tonic receptors um, the generator potential that they produce is exactly proportional to the stimulus right so if it's small and you don't reach a threshold you have no action potentials if it's larger um, in uh, relationship to the size of that potential is how many action potentials you will have. So a very large stimulus, lots, very high frequency of potentials. Okay, but phasic, on the other hand, phasic receptors are interesting in that 
a sustained stimulus, you will start to get fewer and fewer action potentials. So at, with the same amount of stimulus applied and sustained, you will see fewer and fewer action potentials. And so that's why it's called fast adapting. It's adapting to that stimulus, and now you need more stimulus to be able to uh, withstand that same amount of action potentials. So it's fast adapting. These are really good for detecting change, a change in the environment. Okay, tonic receptors, on the other hand, they are constant, they are proportional, and so we call those slow adapting, slow adapting or non-adapting um, example, that would be pain, right? So we have our phasic, fast adapting, the rate of action potentials will quickly decrease if the stimulus stays the same. Um, so sensing pressure, right? So our Pacinian um, corpuscle uh, is a great example, right? You put on your clothes and for the most part, you don't feel them throughout the day because the pressure they're putting on you is fairly consistent throughout the day so you don't notice it. Of course, you also have other things like hairs that it can rub against so sometimes you feel it a little bit um, on your other receptors um, but I think you get the point. Okay, so uh, phasic, fast adapting, alerting us to changes in the environment, tonic, slow adapting, so things like pain, right? Uh, the rate of action potentials will stay constant. Um, okay, so on that note, uh, remember to review your cutaneous receptors, right? So your Merkel's discs are located near the top of your skin in the epidermis. Um, these are individual discs. They're, um, they're free discs here. Um, they're really good at noting indentation, things pressing, um, gently onto the skin um, or texture, right? Um, Mesen, uh, Meisner's carpuscle will um, note changes in texture. Also, notice that these discs are all contained within um, like a capsule-like structure. So that's what that carpuscle is referring to, these structures that are containing um, mini discs. Um, so that's your Meisner's and it's good for detecting texture. It's also in the top layer um, toward in your epidermis, okay? Then you have your free nerve endings. So notice that these are just tiny, there's no discs at the end, right? Um, those are just the free nerve endings and those are things for um, pain, hot, cold, um, also some touch as well. So you can see touch is we have lots of receptors that uh, work together to give us our touch. Um, then we also have uh, Ruffini endings, which detect skin stretch. And these are almost capsules, but they're open at the end. Okay, so you have lots of, of nerves with discs. Um, and then the ends of this capsule are open. So it's kind of different. And these are deep, um, pretty deep in your skin layer. Um, you have your root hair plexus. These are wrapped around your uh, root hair. Um, and as anything moves the position of those hairs, it will trigger these, um, the root hair plexus. So you detect a change in the position of the hair. So light brushing, okay. Um, and then lastly, the deepest deep down are the Pacinian uh, carpuscle. And notice you have discs throughout and it's also an onion shaped kind of ring um, cl closed in a capsule. Okay, so Pacinian carpuscle detects the vibrations and deep pressure, okay. So a few interesting things. We have a lot more cold receptors than we do warm. And the cold receptors are more um, closer to the surface than the warm receptors. Um, but if you have something that's very hot or very cold, it is going to cause a pain response. Um, capsation is a chemical from chili peppers or other 
um, hot peppers that cause both your heat receptors and your pain receptors to be um, stimulated, okay? And menthol is another chemical and it activates or stimulates your cold receptors. However, we have no receptor for itch. There's no such thing as an itch receptor. Itching is a more complex process. We won't even be talking about it, but it is caused by inflammation. Um, inflammation is typically um, caused by histamines. Um, this could be in response to a mosquito bite or an injury. Um, and damaged cells tend to release histamine, causing local inflammation, which can cause pain and then other times can cause itching um, or both. Okay, so remember to review in lab. We had um, a lab on sensory, so make sure you review, review those neural pathways. Also re review what referred pain is, um, the receptive field, and the two-point threshold. So real briefly, we can review those um, together. So an example of your neural pathway is that, you know, your stimuli um, send information uh, through the afferent pathway to the central nervous system, to the efferent, and then to the effector, right? We also um, talked about referred pain. We, we hit our funny bone or ulnar nerve um, and that sent pain down the whole um, forearm, even maybe into your hand and um, fingers, right? Um, and then we talked about different organs, if something's wrong with them, as they send signals of, you know, whether it be inflammation or whatever, um, they will meet up into the same pathway, um, your cutaneous pathway, so your referred pain tends to um, be wherever it meets up into that pathway is where you tend to feel the pain. And so someone with a kidney infection could have pain anywhere in their flank area of their uh, mid to low back and even the um, abdomen, right? Um, receptive field, uh, we talked about how we have a clustered distribution of receptors throughout the skin and that we can map the location of those um, by using the two-point threshold, right? So um, finding where you can distinguish between two points, um, the closest distance between two points that you're able to distinguish, and that will tell you about the density of receptors in that area. Um, so the receptive field of a neuron serving the cutaneous sensation is the area of the skin that, when stimulated, changes the firing rate of the neuron. So this indirectly will also stimulate your postcentral virus. And, um, and that's basically, that's your receptive field in the skin, the area that responds to stimulus. Okay. Now, taste. Okay, so gustation, gustation, not gestation, pregnancy, okay, um, gustation, you have a, in a taste bud, you have lots of cells, um, 50 to 100 specialized epithelial cells, and those all will project um, long microvilli out the top, which we call taste hairs. So they're not really hairs, they're microvilli. They are part of the specialized epithelial cells within your taste bud. And within each and every taste bud, you will have all five types of taste cells. So we can taste five different categories and each taste bud will contain all of the five taste cells. Okay, so we used to believe that certain regions of the tongue were for sweet or spicy, etc. Now we know that it's actually every single taste bud will have the ability to distinguish those different tastes. Okay, so these are epithelial cells. They're not um, 
neurons, but they behave like neurons. So salty, the taste cells within the taste bud that are specialized to taste salt, they will be depolarized in response to sodium. Sour taste cells within the taste bud will be stimulated by hydrogen ions. Um, sweet cells will be stimulated by sh sugars. We have a lot of different types of molecules of sugar, um, so I'm not giving you anything specific here. Um, and then umami, the most recently discovered um, taste, um, turns out it's uh, we only need to be able to detect two different amino acids, glutamate and aspartate, um, because practically all uh, meat and savory things will contain one or both of these amino acids. So we don't need to be able to detect all the amino acids, just these two. And so um umami um, taste cells within your taste bud would be stimulated or fire an action potential in response to glutamate or aspartate. And then lastly, we have our bitter cells that detect bitter things like quinine or other um, molecules and even toxins will uh, depolarize those taste cells. And again, you have all five of these, um, more than one, you know, 50 to 100 of these cells within each taste bud. Um, after the cell is depolarized, right, so the specific cell will respond to only its um, specific um, stimulus, right? So salty with sodium, for example. After uh, the sodium has depolarized the cell, the cell will fire an action potential and then release neurotransmitters. So these epithelial cells are special, specialized epithelial cells because they behave like neurons. The neurotransmitters then stimulate sensory neurons, which signal the brain, and then you detect the taste. Okay, so salty, we have an example here, right? So the salty lands on one of the um, taste hairs and causes a depolarization of that taste cell, okay? and you know as the action potential travels you open up your uh, calcium channel to release your neurotransmitter um, and then that will um, stimulate the sensory neuron stimulated and you'll send that to the brain okay you don't need to memorize um, necessarily this uh, detail here you what you need to know is that uh, you know each taste bud has all types of taste cells and each taste cell will only respond to its particular stimulus. So salty responds to sodium, sour responds to hydrogen, okay? Um, you also need to know that for sweet, umami, and bitter, these are called the gustusins, and that requires G protein. So they're slightly more complicated than the salty and sour taste, right? So that's it. You don't need to know all the all the details. You need to know that it's a G protein, okay? All right, so smell. Smell, you know that you have your olfactory bulb here, and you have your um, cilia, in the nasal cavity that will bind to the odor molecules. 